Hi, this is Elliot from EO Nutrition, and in today's video, we will be looking at how high dose vitamin B1 therapy or high dose thiamine supplementation can be very beneficial in fibromyalgia. So, first of all, we will be examining some of the problems that occur in fibromyalgia, both in the brain and the central nervous system with regard to pain processing, and then also. Um, some of the problems that go wrong in the periphery. We'll be looking at what evidence there is to demonstrate that there is a functional problem or a, uh, an issue with processing thiamine in fibromyalgia. And then we'll also be looking at exactly how thiamine might help in someone who does have fibromyalgia. First of all, for those who are not aware, there was a doctor, his name was Dr. Antonio Constantini. Him and his colleagues um, ran a case report of three patients with fibromyalgia in 2013. They gave extremely high doses of thiamine HCL. This was ranging between 600 milligrams per day and 1,800 milligrams per day, which the patients took orally. Now, just for reference, the recommended daily allowance is between one milligram and 1.5 milligrams. So that was up to 18, um, 1,800 times the recommended daily allowance. So what they found after 20 days, um, 30, there was a 37 to 71% reduction in fatigue and a 50 to 80% reduction in pain. Now, different individuals responded with different kind of results, um, but generally, among all three, they found a significant improvement in the symptoms. Now, one of the interesting things was that two of the patients saw no benefits until they got up, got up to 1,500 milligrams. Um, and this is quite common, I think, is that people might read about thiamine and they try it at a, a low dose or the wrong form and they do not see the benefits. So in that case report, the doctor who who authored the study um, essentially hypothesized in a similar way to Dr. Darren Lonsdale that what was going on was that there was perhaps some kind of an enzymatic downregulation, maybe some kind of a genetic polymorphism in the way that cells utilize thiamine and that this required very high doses. So I highly recommend for anyone who's not familiar with this study to check this one out. It was a small sample size, but it definitely did provide some interesting results. Now, this is something that I have also seen clinically, and it's important that we try to flesh out the details so that we can understand how this simple nutrient, vitamin B1, can provide such amazing results in a very complex condition like fibromyalgia. But to understand how thiamine can be beneficial in fibromyalgia, we need to look at some of the basics of how the body processes pain. Now, this is a highly simplified look at things, and I go into a little bit more detail in an article that I wrote on this topic, and that is linked in the bottom of the, the video. So the nervous system, the way that it is detecting pain, um, the process is actually referred to as nociception. So nociception is pain sensing. And so here's a, a pretty simplified diagram, but essentially stimulus is detected via sensory neurons, and this is in the periphery. So this can be in the hand or in the leg or on the skin, wherever. And what is essentially happening is the information is carried up these neurons up to a portion of the spinal cord, and this is referred to as the spinal dorsal horn. The information is then relayed through a couple different cells and it's passed up to the brain where it's processed. And it's processed in a variety of different brain regions. It's being passed from one area to another area and you're having amplifying or dampening signals there. And then we are having the perception of pain. That's how we are feeling pain. And pain or nociception can be kind of uh, classified as two different branches. So we have pro-nociception and we have anti-nociception. Pro-nociception is essentially the function or a set of pathways and functions in the brain and in the nervous system, which essentially act as an on switch for pain. They increase it, they amplify it. And the neurons um, passing these messages essentially use or 
yeah, they, they utilize specific um, neurochemicals. These include substance P, the, these include um, the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate, and there is also nerve growth factor. On the other hand, we also have a counter-regulatory or opposing function, and this is referred to as antinociception. And so this is playing an inhibitory role. It essentially is the off switch for pain. It can decrease pain. And this is using other neurochemicals in a general sense. So this is using norepinephrine or noradrenaline. It's using serotonin or dopamine or the endogenous opioid system. And so ordinarily, we should have a good balance between these two functions at any one given time. We don't want too much pronociception without having the antinociception. On the other hand, we don't want it to go the other way around um, either. And so you can think of it, essentially, a balancing act between these functions allows the body to be able to respond to any given stimulus in the appropriate way. So for instance, if we stand on a large thorn, then that should ordinarily, and that should rightly cause us pain. However, simply touching or stroking our arm should not. Now, the problem is in fibromyalgia, what tends to happen is that someone experiences bodily pain which is completely inappropriate to the to the stimulus that they come 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 across. Some of the the defects in this system have been identified in fibromyalgia. One of those is elevated levels of these chemical mediators which are involved in pronociception. So these are substance P and nerve growth factor. These these have been found in higher amounts in fibromyalgia. Likewise, there has been found to be um, higher levels of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate in several areas of the brain. So the spinal neurons have also been identified to be hypersensitive. So we will go into this in a little bit more detail later on, but essentially what it means is that the messages which are responsible for producing the feeling of pain can, um, can occur at an increased rate. Furthermore, there is also immune activation in the brain which can increase the pronociception function. On the other hand, the chemical mediators which are supposed to be involved in the inhibitory or the antinociceptive function, so the, the, this, this system which is meant to dampen pain, um, generally there have been shown to be lower levels of these chemicals, so dopamine, serotonin, serotonin and norepinephrine. And so here's another very basic diagram. Essentially, nociceptors are the sensory receptors. They are the receptors which are detecting stimulus, detecting information. They are carrying that to the spinal cord. And in fact, there are cells or bundles of neurons located along the spinal column. And these are referred to as uh, dorsal root ganglia. Uh, they're abbreviated here as DRG. The dorsal root ganglion have been th are thought to play a key role in um, in chronic pain disorders, and this is because they are responsible for conveying information to the higher centres um, to tell the brain that there is a painful stimulus. Now, ordinarily, when this is done at a normal rate, then this is not a problem. However, we can develop what is referred to as hyper excitability. And this is when you have excessive firing of these neurons, and this relates to the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. What can happen there is that you have excessive signals sent to the brain to communicate pain when this is inappropriate for the type of stimulus that the body is coming into contact with. Interestingly, there is a condition called small fiber neuropathy. Small fiber neuropathy is one of the main um, forms of diabetic neuropathy. It primarily affects the unmyelinated neurons. Um, and there, this, this dorsal root ganglia hypersensitivity or hyper excit excitability is also thought to play a key role in that condition as well. Now, interestingly, severe fibromyalgia is associated with certain genetic polymorphisms which render dorsal root ganglion neurons to be hyper excitable. And so this is considered by some researchers to play 
probably play play a, a significant role in fibromyalgia. It's interesting because around 30 to 50% of fibromyalgia patients have been found to have neuropathy, small fiber neuropathy in particular. And this has led researchers to, to, to theorize that the pain of fibromyalgia may also be neuropathic in origin and may relate directly to the hyper excitability of these DRG neurons. In fibromyalgia, there is mitochondrial dysfunction. So contrary to popular belief that, that fibromyalgia is merely a psychosomatic disorder, essentially there are genuine changes in how the cells process energy. So in skin biopsies, in muscle biopsies, and in white blood cells, there are several markers of mitochondrial dysfunction. Many of the enzymes which are involved in ATP synthesis, whether it be in the Krebs cycle or whether it be directly in the electron transport chain, there are defects in how these enzymes work. So some enzymes are structurally abnormal, other enzymes are working at a lower rate. Um, the mitochondria itself, the cristae, are um, irregular, they're weird shapes and sizes. There is deletions to the mitochondrial DNA, this has been shown. There is excessive reactive oxygen species, and there is also a lower ATP production and excessive lactate or lactic acid synthesis. If we look directly at the biochemical markers of what occurs in fibromyalgia, it's very much a systemic disorder. The evidence has shown elevated levels of lactic acid, and this positively correlates with the amount of pain experienced in the muscles of people with fibromyalgia. There are elevated levels of DNA damage and oxidative stress. There are depleted levels of glutathione, catalase and superoxide dismutase. So these are uh, key intracellular antioxidants. And when there are low levels, generally that is indicative of systemic oxidative stress. Furthermore, there is excessive reactive oxygen species. Now it's interesting because excessive reactive oxygen species are directly related to pain, um, chronic pain, to pain sensitization, and this is through multiple mechanisms which I speak about in the article. I just mentioned lactic acid, and for those of you who aren't aware, you will be familiar with the burn of lactic acid if you recall back to a time that you've done strenuous exercise and you feel the burn in your muscle. Essentially, lactic acid is a normal byproduct of metabolism and it's produced all the time in very small amounts. It's actually really important in the brain. However, when it's produced in too much quantity, it can cause problems. Um, but it's also more reflective of an underlying problem with metabolism, which is going to produce or is going to uh, produce a situation where there is a lack of cellular energy. So just the basics to go over quickly, when we digest carbohydrates or when we eat carbohydrates, we derive glucose from that. And glucose is essentially, we are tasked with taking the energy from glucose. We have to break it down further. So the first step is that we take glucose and we break it down into two smaller molecules of pyruvate. Now pyruvate is ordinarily fed through an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase, and that is using thiamine as a cofactor, among other things. Now, this is the initial step towards what is referred to as oxidative metabolism. For several different reasons, which are way too complicated to go into in this video, uh, essentially when there is a block on pyruvate dehydrogenase for whatever reason, a couple of examples could be hypoxia. So when we do not have enough oxygen, when we are lacking in one of the cofactors, when we have mitochondrial dysfunction, or alternatively, when we are deficient in thiamine. You see that thiamine, the TPP, active form of thiamine, is a cofactor for pyruvate dehydrogenase. And so if we do not have that cofactor, or any of the other cofactors for that matter, then pyruvate dehydrogenase is effectively inhibited, or blocked, or inactivated. And so what we end up doing is for reasons that I'm not gonna go into in this uh, talk, we end up shunting pyruvate towards um, this metabolic byproduct, which is called lactate or lactic acid. Now, unfortunately, when we have 
chronic mitochondrial dysfunction and we shift metabolism towards this anaerobic, this non-oxygen -oxy um, using pathway, we're yielding much less ATP, much less energy, we're yielding lots of lactate. Now lactate changes the way how cells work in a variety of ways. Um, but what it also does in the context of fibromyalgia is it signals for inflammatory markers, chemicals which will increase pain. It also changes the tissue pH to become more acidic. And there we have sensitization of neurons, which effectively cause pain. So this is one of the ways by which mitochondrial dysfunction in the muscles, in the periphery, and this is completely separate to having central sensitization with pronociception and antinociception. This is actually um, a chemical abnormality which is causing pain and discomfort in the muscles, which is being detected by the sensory neurons, and the information is sent to the brain. So there are findings in fibromyalgia which are consistent with this idea that there is a functional thiamine deficiency. And that might mean that they are getting enough in their diet and they might have enough in their blood, but the cells are not using thiamine in the way that they should. So in fibromyalgia, we have higher levels of pyruvate have been identified. There is also a high pyruvate to lactate ratio and a high TPP effect. So what these are consistent with is um, they are generally what you would find also in a thiamine deficiency. All of these things have been noted in a thiamine deficiency. Another thing that they found was that the enzymes which use thiamine, um, they had a very low uh, affinity for the cofactor, so for, for thiamine itself. And this is a problem. Essentially, what this means is that you need more of the cofactor, in this case, it's thiamine, you need more thiamine to achieve the same amount of enzyme activity, so to convert one thing into another thing, um, than someone else would. So in simple terms, the requirement for thiamine is significantly higher because the enzyme does not have as much affinity for the cofactor. You've got to give more cofactor. And finally, what they also found was that there was lower levels of active TPP. So blood levels have shown that thiamine is fairly normal in fibromyalgia in a couple of studies. But this collection of findings, along with the clinical experience of many who have seen that fibromyalgia greatly responds to thiamine therapy, it's conceivable, and I believe it to be the case, is that in fibromyalgia, like many other conditions, there may be this, this fundamental problem inside cells with how they are processing the nutrient. And it simply might be the case that the only way to bypass these issues with processing that nutrient is to give them in higher amounts. And when we're talking about higher amounts, we're talking about mega dosing. And so simply giving 10 or 15 times the recommended daily allowance may not be effective to bypass these problems. How does thiamine actually work in fibromyalgia? How can it achieve remission in some people? How can it reduce the pain? How can it improve the fatigue? Well, if we look at the brain, thiamine has been shown to clear excess glutamate. It can reduce, there was a study showing that it reduced the DRG neuron, the dorsal root ganglion neuron, hyperexcitability. Now remember that the excess glutamate is going to stimulate hyperexcitability or neuroexcitotoxicity. Likewise, the neuron hyperexcitability in the DRG neurons is theorized to play key roles in fibromyalgia. With giving thiamine, what it can do is it can calm down this system. At the same time, we have an inhibition of the nociceptive neurons in the spir spinal cord. The neurons which are detecting pain can be inhibited by a high dose of thiamine. It's been shown that high dose thiamine can also reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is both in the brain and also systemically. Finally, in the brain, it is important to use a type of thiamine that gets into the brain simply because thiamine can very much increase 
the rate of energy metabolism in brain cells. It's specifically for this reason that thiamine is protective against many different neurodegenerative conditions, including traumatic brain injury as well. So traumatic brain injury is not a neurodegeneration, but it can cause neurodegeneration. It's a major insult to the brain, and actually preloading with a very high dose thiamine has been shown to be protective against the effects of traumatic brain injury in terms of protecting against oxidative stress. If we look at what thiamine can do in the periphery or systemically, thiamine has been used as a method to improve nerve cell regeneration and neurotransmission. If we consider the potential role of small fiber neuropathy in fibromyalgia, then it makes sense why if some of the pain in fibromyalgia was neuropathic in origin, then thiamine would be um, a prime candidate, first of all, to address that. Thiamine has been used in many different types of neuropathic pain, particularly in diabetic neuropathic pain, with very good results. Thiamine is also a cofactor for an enzyme called transketolase. Now, transketolase is increasing NADPH, and we are using NADPH to regenerate glutathione. Take the oxidized form of glutathione and actually regenerate it to its reduced form so that it can go on and carry on being an ox antioxidant. In this way, thiamine has been shown time and time again to reduce oxidative stress, particularly in the nervous system, but also systemically and in various different organs as well, including the liver. Recall the elevated levels of lactate found in the muscles. Also recall that the enzyme which is taking pyruvate, running it down that oxidative pathway, needs thiamine as a cofactor. And now giving high doses of thiamine can very much push that pathway, push pyruvate down the oxidative pathway and increase the activity of the pyruv pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. Thiamine is not only important for that enzyme, it's also another co it's a cofactor for another Krebs cycle enzyme. But on top of that, it is an allosteric um, activator or regulator of various other enzymes in the process as well. So giving a high dose thiamine can actually support the activity of a variety of enzymes involved in energy metabolism, which thiamine is not directly a cofactor for. The analgesic effects of thiamine have been shown many times before. So one, one research study showed that, there, um, that high dose thiamine was effective against thermal hyper, hyperalgesia, so thermal pain, basically. Um, they also found that in the animals, giving a high dose reduced the edema in pores, which suggested that it was also anti-inflammatory at the same time. It has been used in arthritis. Um, it reduced the pain in chemical-induced arthritis. And it's been used in children with a condition called acrodynia, acrodynia being pain of the hands. Now, these children also had high pyruvate. That is something that we find in fibromyalgia uh, subjects in, in the research. And it's been shown that giving high-dose thiamine um, in these children, the disappearance of symptoms occurred within a couple of weeks. It turns out that historically, thiamine has been known to be an agent which is very effective against pain. So in the 1930s, they were using it um, in this one study showed that 10 milligrams injected into the amputation stump um, provided considerable relief in 30 out of 35 patients. There was another study which looked at um, conditions related to neurological and muscle pain, and there were a variety of conditions that they were using it for, but they used anywhere from 10 to 100 milligrams in injected intraspinally. And what they found was that there was a significant improvement in all patients. Thiamine was used in dentistry, so they used to inject it in the mouth next to dental sockets, um, and there was pretty good results with that. There was one case study of bilateral shoulder pain 
um, and they produced a disappearance of pain within a few weeks. Um, and then finally, in the 1950s, apparently it was well established in the Soviet Union, Union that they were using very high doses um, to provide pain relief for women in childbirth. So there was one study looking at 40 to 300 milligrams per day, um, and this was shown to produce pain relief in 50% of 622 patients. So just to summarize everything that we have spoken about, essentially this video is to look at what is involved in fibromyalgia. It's by no means exhaustive, but we're looking at some of the physiological causes. And so it's not just in the brain, it's this complex interplay between what's going on in the brain, how the brain is processing information, and also all of the other systemic dysfunction going on at the same time. And actually what we see is that fibromyalgia is very much a systemic condition. In fibromyalgia, there is evidence that these individuals may, in some cases at least, have a lack of ability to properly process thiamine in the cells. It's hypothesized that these individuals have a functional deficiency or maybe they have some kind of enzymatic abnormality, some enzymatic downregulation, and there have been a couple of case studies which have shown that they respond very well to high dose thiamine. Now, I've also seen this clinically, so I know that it works in some people, but you need to go very high dose. Now, here are the ways that thiamine can help. Thiamine does possess antinociceptive and analgesic effects. It can reduce glutamate excitotoxicity. It can reduce uh, dorsal root ganglion hyperexcitability. It improves neuro neurotransmission. It improves nerve regeneration, so it reduces pain associated with um, neurons. It reduces neuroinflammation. It improves redox status through boosting antioxidant systems. And this is not only glutathione, but it also has a positive effect on other antioxidant systems. And it is also very effective at clearing lactic acid through increasing oxidative metabolism, increasing pyruvate dehydrogenase activity. And so finally, I am often asked after I do a video or write an article like this, what is the best form to take? I'm convinced that the most optimal is thiamine tetrahydrofurfural disulfide. Now, of course, it's highly individual. Some people might respond to HCL, other people might respond to benfotiamine, but I think that the benefits of TTFD are thoroughly untapped and it's quite unknown. So the reason I think TTFD is the best form is simply because TTFD is, is its molecular configuration allows it to have a superior bioavailability to any other form. It bypasses all cellular, cellular transport membranes. This is not simply in the gut, but this is in the brain. It does penetrate the blood-brain barrier. It does penetrate the cells. And so if there is a problem getting thiamine into the cells, then using TTFD is fantastic. TTFD was well studied by Derek Lonsdale. It was also well, story, well studied by Japanese researchers since the 1950s. Fortunately, it's not very well known about in the West, but they favored it in, the, in, in Japan for very good reason. So there's only two companies who sell this. One is called Ecological Formulas, and they sell a product called Alithiamin, and there is Objective Nutrients, and we sell a product called Thymax. The only difference between those two is that Thymax contains no fillers, it contains no additives, and that is why I made it, um, because it doesn't have anything which people who are generally very sensitive to supplements, they react negatively to. So either of those brands is going to be sufficient. You know, I'm not just recommending my own. If you're not sensitive, then you know you can use whatever brand you want. If you are sensitive, I'd recommend going for the ones without the fillers and without the unnatural ingredients. Either way, they both contain TTFD. Either way, I've had clients benefit from both of them. So simply, I think that if someone has fibromyalgia, if they have tried thiamine, if they tried lower doses, I would recommend going to a higher dose. If they have not tried TTFD, I 100% recommend that they should try it. 
You must remember that when you take thiamine, it's really important to take it with the cofactors. That includes generally magnesium. Uh, it can include potassium because thiamine tends to tank potassium in some people. Generally, it also requires a B complex. That is a very rough overview of what should be recommended. And there is other stuff, but it kind of needs. I hope that you, um, that you now have a better understanding of why thiamine can help people, why those results were achieved in the Constantini study, why I have also seen it work wonders in certain people with fibromyalgia. Um, it is a really useful nutrient and I think that more people need to know about it. So if you like this video, if you found it helpful, please like and subscribe to my page. You can find me on Facebook as EO Nutrition. You find my website at www.eonutrition.co.uk. Alternatively, you can buy Thymax at www.objectivenutrients.com. We sell in the US and also in the EU. Um, if you found this video helpful, then you can share it as well. That would be fantastic. Otherwise, thank you and I will see you next time.